Good morning. My name is Patsy Lewis, and I'm the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. And it's my pleasure to invite you to the second talk in our series, Archives of Silence, which explores um, experiences, different experiences across the region with um, the pandemic, violence, and in this case, we're looking at um, racism, how different um, communities in Latin America have sought to think about racism and how that might be different from how we understand it. And we have with us to take us through this and to, to, um, to engage with the work they have been doing on this. Um, professors Monica Moreno Figueroa from Cambridge University and Professor Peter Wade from the University of Manchester. And the, it's my pleasure to invite Professor Juliet Hooker, who is professor in the political science department here at Brown to moderate the session. So I just wanna welcome you all. And I'm very happy um, to welcome Peter and Monica um, to this discussion. And I will hand it over to Professor Hooker right now. Thanks, Thank Patsy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to have a chance to uh, participate in this uh, discussion with uh, two people who have been in conversation with and collaboration with for many years. Um, um, and so it's, it's, it's too bad that we don't have Monica and Peter here in person, but it's great that we get to have them um, on Zoom. So I'm just going to uh, briefly share their bios and then turn things over to them. So Monica Moreno Figueroa is a Black Mestiza woman, associate professor in sociology and fellow in social sciences at Downing College at the University of Cambridge. She co-leads the Decolonized Sociology Working Group and with Dr. Ella McPherson, she runs the End Everyday Racism Project, a web-based platform to report and monitor racism in higher education. From 2017 to 2021, she was the University Race Equality Co-Champion at Cambridge. Her research focuses on the intersectional lived experience of race and racism in Mexico and Latin America, anti-racism and academic activism, feminist theory, and the interconnections between beauty, emotions, and racism. Her latest research project is a large ESRC funded research project, Latin American Anti-Racism in a Post-Racial Age, La Poda, for which she was the PI together with Professor Wade on anti-racist practices and discourses in Latin America, and from which a book is forthcoming in 2022. And this, I believe, is what they will be speaking about today. Peter Wade is professor of social anthropology at the University of Manchester. His publications include Blackness and Race Mixture, Race and Ethnicity in Latin America, Race, Nature and Culture, an Anthropological Perspective, and Race and Sex in Latin America, Mestizo Genomics, Race Mixture, Nature and Science in Latin America, and Race and Introduction. In 2017 and 19, he co-directed the La Pora project with Monica Moreno Figueroa, and he is co-editing the volume that is um, emerging from that project. He's directing a project on cultures of anti-racism in Latin America, and is co-investigator in a project titled Comics and Race in Latin America. Um, I just want to say that um, uh, I. I'm really looking forward to hearing about the, the book that has come from La Pora. And I think there's been a wave of um, comparative research on racism in Latin America, and in particular focusing not just on racial formations, right, the different racial orders that have developed, but also on the, the movements that are engaged in anti-racist resistance. And La Pora is is one of those projects. And um, so it's great to hear um, what uh, the results of it have been. So welcome and thank you, Monica and Peter. Thank, thank you, you very much, uh, Julia and Patsy for your introduction. So I'm gonna share my screen. <clears throat> um, yeah. 
Can you see that? And um, so I'm going to start us off with, um, well, just sharing like the title of our talk, Alternative Grammars of Anti-Racism um, of Latin America. And here we have the book that uh, Juliet was talking about and that we're very, very pleased and proud that it's coming out 22nd of March this year. And, and hopefully you will, um, with this talk, you get to know a little bit about it and see, um, make the decision to get it and talk about it and think with us about it. So first of all, I want to say that this project comes about, this book is a result of a project where loads of people participated. Um, it ran from 17 to 19, and there were four teams in Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, and Mexico, where uh, national investigators, researchers, national advisors were really um, helpful, um, well, not only helpful, I mean, they run the project, we did it together. So whatever we present here is not just like Peter and my own thinking, but it's a thinking that we developed together. I also want you to see these people, to just give them a space to recognize their presence and their amazing work that is translated now in the book and some of what we're gonna talk about today. So basically this project was looking at these four countries, trying to do a comparative and relational analysis of anti-racist and anti-racist um, anti discourses and practices or actions throughout. And we were basically focusing on the different um, efforts, mobilization or strategies developed by indigenous and black peoples throughout these four places. And looking mainly at four main areas or re research spaces from state institutions to NGOs, social grassroots movements, and also some legal cases. So what we're gonna um, be talking today is about a kind of key finding that we brings, brings some of this together. So I'm gonna pass now this to Pete. Thank you, Monica, yeah. Um, so the, the context for our uh, project was what might be called post-multiculturalism. This is, um, a subject that uh, Juliet has uh, edited a, a book on where she traces a move or her, she and her colleagues uh, from the anti-racist research and action network, uh, trace a move from the kind of multiculturalism of the 1990s in Latin America, all the reforms that took place in that period uh, that led to recognition, a kind of recognition, a legal and constitutional recognition politics uh, of a multiculturalist bent. And then, you know, subsequent sort of disenchantment with those rights regimes um, and uh, increasing racist backlash against those rights from uh, sort of the middle classes, the uh, entrenched interests and so on, who are uh, against these, uh, the rights for indigenous and, and black peoples. Um, and we found that in the context of that racist backlash, there's also been a turn to anti-racism so that more organizations, more grassroots organizations are, are thinking in terms or talking about racism as a kind of way of framing their, 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 their struggles. And of course, at the same time, uh, governments are co-opting that process and also uh, creating you know, institutes and centers and so on um, that try to tackle racism, uh, often in a very superficial and sort of cooperative way. So that's the kind of the, the context. And so, we, you know, we were, our project started um, at the time when people, there was this sort of turn to, to anti-racism, an increased focus on the, the idea of racism or the word racism and so forth. Um, we found in our work that there were very diverse ways of talking about racism, uh, using the word racism, using the concept racism, sometimes not talking about racism um, or not using that word explicitly and not framing the struggle as, an, as one of anti-racism. So we found there was explicit, some, and some people talked explicitly about racism and about anti-racism. Um, they named it very directly. Some people kind of avoided that issue or maybe didn't talk about racism, maybe talk about discrimination, maybe talk about social inequality, maybe talk about unfairness and so on. Um, people also, uh, there was a lot of diversity around how people conceived of racism. Was it a kind of uh, a, a few people with bad attitudes who behaved badly? Um, 
that was kind of could be thought of as racism and uh, treating people badly or was there did people think about it in a more sort of structural way to think about racism as a as a whole system of the apportionment of of wealth and power and so on across across a whole society so we found this diversity and we were you know thinking well how do we deal with that um, and specifically what are the implications for anti-racist strategies Monica, can you move it on? Thank you. Um, and this is important because it's obviously a question of how, how do we best tackle racialized inequality and injustice? So you know, simplifying quite a lot, we can say there are two sort of opposed points of view. One which sees uh, questions of race and especially racism as kind of incidental to capitalism and liberalism. So in principle, capitalism and liberalism are kind of uh, in principle perfectible. They could uh, in principle, in theory, achieve a democratic, egalitarian society and so on. Um, opposing point of view is that race and racism are actually constitutive of capitalism, liberalism and what we might call modernity. Uh, that is to say, these things couldn't exist without racism uh, and sexism and heterosexism uh, and so forth. That is to say, inequality of some kind, and specifically in this case, racist inequality, is built into these systems and they can't exist without it. So that's a current of thought that we can find in lots of different theoretical approaches, post-colonialism, race critical theory, uh, coloniality, Afro-pessimism and uh, black radicalism and so forth. Now, in both these different approaches, one might think that the first, if you want to tackle racism, the first thing you have to do is actually kind of recognize it and talk about it and name it in a quite explicit way. So that seems to be apparently one, one thing you'd have to do. In the second approach, particularly, um, seeing racism as constitutive tends to set the bar for action or effective action very high. So if you don't, if your actions don't challenge that constitutive nature of racism and don't challenge the very kind of framework of, of, of capitalism and liberalism and so on, then you know, you're not going to be successful. Ultimately, you know, your, your anti-racist strategy is going to fall short. And we thought that that was, you know, that tended, to, the, the, the danger of that with that is that one tends to be a bit dismissive of certain kinds of, of activities. So they're not radical enough, they don't go far enough, um, and so on. So, you know, which we thought we were uncomfortable with being dismissive of, of, you know, struggles that people were undertaking in good faith and putting a lot of time and energy in. So we, <laughs> thought that it might be possible to work with what Carolyn Pedwell calls an understanding of the imbrication of the revolutionary in the routine. So to see how sort of habitual everyday behaviors can uh, uh, in, in, encompass some kind of radical revolutionary project uh, and vice versa. So we, as I say, we found a, a great deal of diversity of organizing in Latin America <clears throat> in the case studies that we, uh, we looked at, which we'll talk about a few of which we'll talk about today. Um, and our tendency was, our inclination was to take a kind of an inclusive view, not to dismiss certain things as not being radical enough, um, but to be inclusive, but at the same time to maintain a kind of radical vision overall, a kind of horizon of radical change with which it might be then possible to engage in a dialogue with people who you know, weren't necessarily taking a radical vision and you know, who, who then might want to adjust their, their activities um, to take a more, uh, more head-on approach to, to racism, for example. But at the same time, we, we were also cognizant of the idea that <clears throat> there could be approaches to racism, racism that were indirect, that didn't need necessarily to name racism explicitly and to put it front and center of, uh, of the agenda of a given struggle. So indirect approach, approaches to racism perhaps could also work. So we did come across organizations that talk very explicitly about racism, that used it as a kind of frame for all our activities. One of these was the Colombian organization called Chao Racismo. For, as you can see, racism was absolutely front and center of everything they did. <clears throat> and there were some sort of stru fairly structural dimensions to the way they thought about racism. So they wanted to challenge the equation of negro equals pobre, black equals poor, that, that sort of structural co coincidence of blackness and poverty was, the, was for them the, the problem. And they addressed that problem 
via some certification programs whereby they would assess the recruitment policies of a given company and if they were adequate in terms of diversity and so on they would give them a certificate which you know sort of burnished the the, the company's um, credentials they also um, had some sort of youth directed actions that tried to address uh, the problem of violence uh, and the, the the fact that in Colombia and right across Latin America as we know violence tends to uh, fall disproportionately on black and indigenous peoples. So there was a certain recognition of these structural dimensions, but overall what the program was about, what the organization was about, was a kind of middle class entryism. You know, the way to solve the problem of negro equals poverty was to create a black middle class, uh, to create a, a, uh, an image or a, a reality of blackness that was, in the words of the leader of this organization, fashion, sexy, and chic which I don't think needs translating. Um, so, you know, there wasn't, uh, it, to, in some respects, you could say that their approach sort of fell short of uh, a fully radical approach. It wasn't sufficiently structural enough because it didn't address the, the, the problems of the vast majority of Afro-Colombian people, which is that most of them are poor uh, and face those problems. Nevertheless, it was quite clear that, you know, we didn't want to either, we didn't want to dismiss child racism either because they were doing something that was valuable, which was to bring racism to the, the table in a very explicit way. The next slide, please. But we were also interested in struggles that didn't foreground racism, that didn't make it front and center of what they were doing. And we, we coined the term alternative grammars of anti-racism to talk about these different ways, these indirect ways of addressing racial inequality. And perhaps I won't talk about it now, but in the discussion, we could talk a little bit more if people are interested about you know, why we chose that term, what, why, why the term grammar and so on. So uh, one of the key examples of this kind of alternative or indirect uh, grammar of anti-racism is what I've called a racially aware class consciousness, which is important, we found, because um, A, it, it, it was important in a mestizo society where racialized identities are not necessarily as clear as they are perhaps in, in, in the USA. Um, you know, you have these kind of intermediate categories of brownness, of mestizo, of moreno, and so on that are uh, you know, ambiguous, they have fuzzy boundaries and so forth. So it's not necessarily easy to mobilize people around clear racialized identities. But, and above all, there, it's important in these societies because Latin America, because of its history of conquista, what I, what I call conquistador colonialism, um, race and class coincide very strongly. So in general terms, the darker skinned you are, the more indigenous looking, the, uh, the more African looking you are, the, the tendency is the lower, the lower down the, the, the social scale you are, and the more the lighter skinned, the more European looking you are, the, the higher up the, the scale you are. So race and class coincide strongly, and that's what allows some people to say, oh, well, it's not about race, it's all about class. But it's also a way in which people can mobilize a resistance that takes on board both class and race at the same time. So and I just want to say that uh, you know, other scholars like John Burdick and Keisha Khan Perry on, on Brazil have also noted this, this kind of mixture of, of race, racial and class consciousness. And uh, an artistic collective in, in Argent Argentina that I'm, in my current project is working with, Identia Marron, talk about what they call an anti-racismo conciencia de clase, which isn't quite the same thing because their anti-racismo is you know, front and center of what they're doing, but they're just uh, saying it has to be combined in some way with a, with a class consciousness. So what are the strengths and risks of, these, of this concept of alternative grammars of racism? Well, the strengths are that it addresses in a very direct way the intersection between race and class. You can't talk about one without talking about the other. So it's got immediately this very structural focus. You can never think about racism as just being, you know, a few bad apples, uh, a few people with the wrong kinds of attitudes and so on. It's immediately structural. It's inclusive. So we found that in some cases, indigenous people didn't really want to sort of engage with the idea of racism and they didn't want to frame their struggle as one of being anti-racism. They didn't want to go near the concept of race or, or anything associated with it you know, because they sort of are thinking, well, that's something that we've got rid of, race doesn't exist, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean anything, therefore we don't want to talk in these terms. So, you know, we, you, can, you can create a struggle that includes them without necessarily making 
and anti-racism and racism front and center of what you're doing. At the same time, racism doesn't disappear. You're not just saying, oh no, it's all about class. Racism is still very much part of the, of the picture, as we will see in, in the examples that we're going to look at. The risks of this approach are that there is always a tendency to underestimate the very integral role that racism and racialization play in reproducing inequality. The fact that you know, uh, racism and, and racialization tend to naturalize very easily these inequalities, and they also tend to dehumanize very power, or they have the, the ability to dehumanize very powerfully um, the, um, the, the subordinate uh, groups in, in a racially unequal society. So we're now going to look at some examples, uh, three cases from Brazil, Mexico, and Ecuador, and we'll look at how explicitly racism is named or not named in these examples, and how um, racism features exactly. And we'll be asking also, what are the possibilities that might be opened up if we take a more radical perspective on racism in each case? And we'll be looking at uh, struggles around safety, around violence and, uh, and, and death first in Brazil, and then around political power in Mexico, and then finally around land in Ecuador. I'll pass it back to Monica now. Thank you. So I, I want to first talk about um, the Red de Comunidades de Movimientos Contra Violencia, who is a real, um, which is a Rio based movement, Rio de Janeiro. And it started in 2003 as a reaction to a series of four police massacres in the city's favelas. It has about 60 members, or it had at the time of the research, most of whom um, are favela dwelling mothers who self-identify as black, as negra. Of these, about 20 are active, which means regularly attending meetings and activities like street protests and demonstrations, registering official complaints, attending court cases, etc. And there, there are also allies and supporters to these um, active members, like students, researchers, and other activists. And they base, they, they really have as a main interlocutor the state of Rio and um, the Defensoria, that like the Ombudsman, um, uh, the public Ombudsman. So the Rede denounces uh, basically their work in, in re denouncing genocide and challenging mainstream drug war narratives, mass incarceration practices, and the criminalization of protest. They denounce racism in the justice system, drawing on data that shows that 71% of homicides in Brazil out of black people, that there has been a 40% rise in black deaths, not just police killings, uh, that in the, in the decade to 2014, and that controlling for age, sex, education, and place of residence, black people in Rio de Janeiro are 24% more often victims of homicide than whites. And that in Sao Paulo state in 2011, blacks were three times more likely than whites to be killed by the police, taking into account their demographic weight. Um, so in all of this and in their work, how central is racism in their discourse and agenda? The women in the network tended to identify as black, as negra, but this was rarely a matter of open discussion or affirmation. The mother's protest against violence, against police violence frequently refers simply to the favelas and young male favela dwellers as the victims. The blackness of many murder sons was not insistently made explicit by the mothers and was usually um, explain alongside being a favelado or being poor, living, uh, living in the favela and being poor as an intersectional whole. Calls were made for justice and against extermination by the state. Racism was not explicitly named in the network's banners and posters. And these all recognize that police violence in favelas has an impact that crosses racial difference and indeed includes significant, significant numbers of white victims as well. And they would say, you know, they will claim for justice and against state extermination claiming this, you know, we are mothers, we are black mothers, indigenous mothers, working mothers, poor mothers, slum mothers, peripheral mothers, we are warrior mothers. 
Yet at the same time, the underlying racialized character of the killings and the protesters was ever present. And among the mothers, the discourse of lethal racism was easily and frequently de deployed in diverse ways. So data on violence are nowadays often collected according to age, sex, and color rather than class. And the correlations between class, neighborhood, and violence are complex, and it's not easy to find clear and simple data. Thus, the availability of data which obeys to states to the state's orientation towards anti-racism tends to highlight racial factors. The word genocide appear occasionally on the banners displayed in public demonstrations, evoking the idea of threats to a particular national, ethnic, racial, or religious group to cite the UN definition. Photos of victims, all young black men, albeit of, although they are from varied skin tones, form a central part um, of this uh, visual aspect of this demonstration. And they made the racialized character of the killing tacitly but abundantly clear, as did the bodies of the mothers themselves. This was a strategic use of bodies and images to highlight suffering and emotion, but also to question the spectacle and bourgeoisism around damaged bodies, and the bodies were clearly racialized. In public speeches, mothers occasionally reiterated the racial bias of the violence and talked of favelas as black territories. In interviews, one mother said, and I read what we put in the slide, my children died at the hands of a racist police force because they were in racialized territory in the favela. Another said, here in Brazil, you do not need to be guilty or involved in crime to be killed. Just be black, poor, and live in the favela to be in the sights of the police. Although a second later, she said only poor and from the favela, reinforcing this absent present following you know, uh, Peter's concept, uh, this absent present quality of racialized identifications. So racism in this case comes into and out of focus, although in this case it was more in focus um, more often than in the subsequent cases that we will analyze and that Peter will present the next one. This implies, this coming in and out of focus, that an awareness of structural racism is there, but not necessarily a consistent strategic use of the explicit talk on race or racism. There was also ambiguity about the intersection of race and class, an appreciation of fact that they did not coincide completely but they did overlap a lot. And this is also the case in the next two cases. So I pass on to Peter. Thank you, Monica. Okay, so the next uh, example is from the, um, the postdoc, uh, Gisela um, Carlos Fregoso, who worked in Mexico. And she worked, one of her case studies was the Congreso Nacional Indígena, which is um, a national organization. So it's, it's, it's different from the previous uh, a case which was a kind of city-based thing. Um, and this is uh, an, an alternative grammar of, of political power. So the case focuses on the initiative that the Congreso Nacional Indígena launched in 2017, which was called the Consejo de Gobierno Indígena, where they tried to get a, a female indigenous leader, this person, Maria de Jesus Patricio, also known as Marichui, uh, onto the presidential slate to be as a candidate. Uh, they, they failed, but uh, there was a lot of, um, of um, publicity around it and so on. So the, yeah, thank you. So the CNI as an organization is very radical, is completely anti-capitalist. Uh, it is linked very strongly with the, um, the Zapatista rebellion of, the of 1994. That's where it had its roots and so on. So it, you know, it takes a very kind of radical structural view of, of, of things. And in keeping with their kind of Marxist approach, um, they don't really focus that much on race and racism. They speak on behalf, they say they speak on behalf of los de abajo, the people from below. And so they, you know, a couple of quotes here, we hear the pain of people of, like us, of all colors, who are el México de abajo. Escuchamos el dolor de todos los colores que somos el México de abajo. Uh, and another quote from their web, these are from their websites. 
it is not only the racism, racism of the political structure that did not allow our proposal to, uh, to get Marie Chui onto the slate to appear on the electoral ballot, because if those who oppose capitalism's destruction of the world shared amongst them slanted, slanted blue and red eyes, i.e. were racially diverse, public policy and supposed democracy would be made to exclude them. So it doesn't matter you know, um, who you are, what color you are, if you oppose capitalism, you'll be excluded. So in keeping with that, there was in their discourse uh, and their writings and so on, there was only occasional reference to, to racism as, as a word as a, and a concept. And often it was kind of mentioned alongside other things like marginality and discrimination. Um, on their website, the, the word racismo appeared only nine times in, in four years of, of posts and news items and so on. But despite that, there was clearly a very strong sense of indigeneity, of being indigenous. There's constant reference to los pueblos indígenas. There was constant reference to the fight for an autonomy that was based on el espacio de los indios que somos, the space of the indios that we are. So there was clearly a very strong sense of indigenous identity here. A sense of racialized subalternity was, not, was below the surface, but it didn't disappear, it was present despite the focus on a kind of class-based discourse and the Marxist orientation, that sense of, you know, we are indigenous and that indigenousness is connected somehow with our oppression and our subaltern status was very clearly there. And that aspect of it became very evident in um, social media racist backlash to Mani Chui's electoral campaign. So, um, you know, lots of stuff was published on social media and went from the social media into into the press on many in many occasions uh, who reported on this stuff. People saying things like I would vote for Marie Chui. You can see she has experience in cleaning Mexico. I she looks like a domestic servant or another one that again uh, riffs on this domestic service thing that Marie Chui looks like the woman who does the cleaning in my house. So there's I mean, these are two particular examples, but there was constant reference to that intersection of race, class and gender around domestic service, um, which made very clear the, the, the racist dimensions of uh, the oppression of indigenous people, indigenous women in, in this case. So that, that discourse of Los de Abajo seems to background evident racism, and yet we can see that there is a clearly a racially aware, and in this case a gendered, uh, class consciousness at work, which is mainly about class, but that sort of sense of it being something to do with race along, along the way is very clearly there. And that's, you know, that can be quite a positive thing because it can build coalitions and they were very into building coalitions, not just, you know, focusing only on indigenous people, but, you know, bringing um, Afro-descendant and Mestizo people on board, other, um, you know, Campesino people and so on. So it can build coalitions, and that's a positive thing. And also it implies immediately a very a structural perspective on the racialized power structure of Mexico. So, you know, uh, a mestiza, you wouldn't have to be an indigenous woman to get angry about those remarks that were made about Marie Chui on, in social media. You know, a dark-skinned mestiza woman who didn't identify as an indigenous could easily get angry about that too and mobilize her, herself to, to um, behind Marie Chui, for example. And, you know, that brings in that sort of structural perspective that uh, of, of inequality, of uh, the structures of inequality. So this is an example of a kind of uneven use of the discourse of racism and anti-racism, but with a clear awareness of um, the inter intersection of racism and classism in a structural way. Okay, thank you, Pete. Um, well, in keeping with uh, Pete's um, naming who was the researcher who did the work for um, the Mexican case. I didn't mention that Luciana Rocha did the one for uh, Brazil. And for the one I'm gonna talk about Ecuador, it was Maria Moreno. And um, in, this, in this case, um, what we found in this um, town and in this, their struggle that we call this Afro-Ecuadorian community versus palm oil, oil multinational giant, the alternative grammar of environment and land. We, what we found is um, first a community, uh, WIMBI, which is a community in the Pacific coastal region of Ecuador 
ancestrally occupied by Black and some indigenous communities. For centuries, but increasingly in the last few decades, this area where wind is located has been subjected to exploitation by outside, mostly white, mestizo, and national international interests for natural resources, basically minerals and timber, but also agro-industrial production, palm oil plantations, shrimp farms uh, mainly. And members of local communities here are often involved in these enterprises as workers in different modalities, which complicates their relationship with um, the difficulties they also have with these same companies. They may also be small entrepreneurs linked to their incoming businesses, and they may, may sell land or rights to resources uh, or concede them in exchange for other benefits like road constructions, for example. However, conflicts emerge over land grabs and over environmental destruction, the use and contamination of water, the destruction of the forest, etc., and illnesses. Resistance by local communities is thus principally about land and the environment. For these uh, local activists, um, they really, they try to, on the one hand, use legal instruments, including rights to the titling of ancestral lands according to them as Afro-Ecuadorian communities, but they also mobilize Ecuador's Defensoria del Pueblo, the uh, ombudsman, the public defender, and they use alliances with the Catholic Church uh, and their pastoral social ministry, and a lot of environmentalist NGOs um, that also are very aware and contributing to their um, struggles and organizing. So in, in these struggles, um, in this particular struggle, racism and anti-racism are not often mentioned explicitly by locals, by allies, or even by some social science analysts of the situation. And when interviews mention the word, it is often in context of direct discrimination rather than structural processes. Yet at the same time, there is an underlying awareness among locals of structural issues linked to their racialized condition. Although in our interviews, it is mostly among certain educated and activist groups that these issues come up and are mentioned. So for example, they would say things like this, you know, they do this to us because we're black, they want to eliminate us, but just because it's, it's only with black and indigenous, indigenous peoples that you can see such abuse. The companies um, say we have won against really important people. Are we going to lose to these negritos? It has been said that the state doesn't care about the lives of black people in the area. And of course, this connection of poverty, class, and race that Pete mentioned before uh, in this quote, in the class of poor people where there are blacks, whites, mestizos, most fucked up of all is the black. There is a racial problem. I believe it's a racial struggle, not a class struggle. Um, so the question of blackness and thus implicitly racism also arises in other ways. First, land can be claimed as ancestral lands, as I said before, of an Afro-Ecuadorian community. Even if this relates to multiculturalism, it still foregrounds a category for which racialized difference could be made evident, and indeed is made evident by some of the of the people here. And secondly, outsiders often portray the region as a whole as inferior, as underdeveloped or uncivilized because of its black and indigenous population. Therefore, there is an underlying racialization linked to the historical geography and moral topography of the country, which creates and sustains on the one hand, a structural link between underdevelopment and blackness and indigeneity. And on the other, it constructs an image of the region as a place open to exploitation by any means necessary in order to make a profit. In this way, the struggles for land and against environmental destruction are also implicitly anti-racist struggles, not just from our point of view as analysts making an argument about the operation of structural racism, but from the point of view of some of the locals as well. So what are the implications of this? And as in the previous cases, we, we want to kind of try to see this, um, the possibilities of the terminology of these 
you know, proposal of thinking of the alternative grammars of anti-racism. So on the one hand, pursuing land and well-being as a local or regional group may be productive in gaining ground in a material sense. In a context of mestizaje or in other contexts of the post-racial denial and the legitimation of racism, it can be an effective tactic for maximizing the legitimacy of claims and struggles in the eyes of others. On the other hand, it leaves implicit a key factor in the suit of mechanisms that reproduce disadvantage and block struggle. So like the Rede and the Congreso Indígena de Gobierno, racism came into and out of focus, although in this case, it was rather less in focus than in the Rede and the Congreso. Uh, Consejo Indígena de Gobierno, sorry. As with the cases of uh, those two cases, there was ambiguity about the intersection of race and class, an appreciation of fact that they did not coincide completely, but they did overlap a great deal. For Wimby, we see a lesser awareness of structural racism alongside a good deal of clarity about the unequal exploitation of land and environmental consequences. A clarity that is nevertheless tinged with a sense that the racialized position of the area's inhabitant is somehow involved in this inequality. There is the, so there is some racially aware class consciousness. Notable in this case, as in the um, con Consejo Indígena de Gobierno is that when racism is adduced in this context, it leads directly to a structural analysis of the topic, going beyond individual discriminations and stigmatizations. As with the Congreso, um, the Consejo, it invites, in this, indeed, it obliges us to consider the whole racialized power structure of Ecuador. So, Pete. Okay, so to, concluding now, um, I mean, the, the, the turn to anti-racism that I described at the beginning, um, that recent focus on the, on the word our racism and the idea of the concept of racism and, and anti-racism as a, as a way of framing a struggle, that's often been seen as useful in Latin American mestizo societies because it's the first step, you know, that, part of the problem in Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, and so on, has been simply making people recognize that racism does exist, that it is a real problem. You know, people have spent uh, decades proving with statistical and ethnographic work that racism does exist, that it's, a, it's an issue. So, you know, that can be seen as, as, as very useful. But also that sort of uni, unifocal focus can lead to some limited outcomes. So the you know, governments have often produced anti-discrimination anti anti legis legislation, which is actually quite limited in its impact, partly because um, the kind of bar for legal proof of racial discrimination is often quite high. So few cases come to court, fewer cases get successfully prosecuted and so on. So whatever their symbolic uh, effectiveness, um, their impact in changing the structures of inequality are, are relatively limited. Um, and also some of that legislation tends to, to deal with discrimination in a very broad way. So any kind of discrimination on the basis of, you know, not just race, but ethnicity, sex, disabilism, whatever, um, gets, it gets lumped in with, this, uh, with, with racism. And so racism tends to lose its, its specificity. Um, so, that, you know, the focus on racism can be useful, but it can have limited outcomes. Um, an alternative is to address these, these kind of class race intersections with, a, with this structural perspective and not to insist on necessarily always insist on making racism front and center of uh, your social struggle agenda. Um, because these alternative grammars address basic structures of inequality, but at the same time, they're also racially aware. They're not just pushing race and racism out of the frame completely. They're just giving it, uh, they're not making it front and center. And I would argue that this provides a kind of foothold, a useful foothold for anti-racism in a mestizo society in particular, in a society where race and class coincide, where racialized identities are not necessarily uh, very clearly defined. This can give us a way to push forward uh, an anti-racist struggle and in quite a radical way um, 
without necessarily making racism front and center of everything we, that we do. Now, some, some people have said, oh, but isn't that just pandering to mestizo fragility, mestizos who don't want to talk about race and racism and you know, would rather not have it sort of you know, it discussed publicly in, in, in the public forum and so on. I don't think that's, necess that's true because we're not pushing racism, you know, that concept isn't pushing racism, racism out of the picture. It's, it's maintaining it strongly there, but just not uh, in a necessarily completely explicit uh, way that, that where the focus is uniquely on on racism. Back to Monica. Yeah. So um, there are, however, risks here of underestimating the importance of the structural of the integral role racism and racialized inequality play in structuring hierarchy and inequality as a whole. So we see, for example, that Wimby locals are unevenly an evenly aware of the historical intersections of race and class via colonialism, which have over the centuries produced the durable and often inflexible layers and accumulations that constitute today's social structures. Even the people of the Consejo Indígena de Gobierno, who often deploy a discourse, a discourse that is explicitly aware of these things, often also put them in a Marxist frame that reduces racism to an ideological tool at the service of capitalism, rather than seeing it as historically constitutive of capitalism and liberal political orders. Also, we see the racist and sexist reaction to Marie Chu's electoral campaign that suggests that it might be necessary at some point to talk more explicitly about racism alongside sexism, as it is not only used as a means of attacking indigenous organizing, but is also a key element in the mechanisms that reproduce inequality more widely in Mexico. So we argue that it is worth exploiting the current turn to anti-racism in Latin America and working with a politically radical horizon in view but also to highlight just how much racism has been and still is integral to the fabric of the class system. That is to highlight racialized dimensions of inequality and of struggles and the systematic character of racialized disadvantage, as well as the possibilities racism offers for processes of naturalization and dehumanization. So this we argue is a worthwhile goal in itself. In working in this way, moreover, other effects might be entailed, like for example, black and indigenous alliances, emphasizing racism is often seen as divisive and causing separation between black people who tend to more easily be thought on and think about in terms of racism and indigenous people who tend to um, avoid the concept, not always, but there is, it's, a, it's a tendency. And, but grasping racism in its structural dimensions and its intersection with class can provide a common platform in, on which to mobilize, like around land, resources, power, security, well being, etc. Another possible um, opening here is this possibility of role of mestizos uh, as allies. The same approach can also give mestizos a way of seeing how they are implicated in the system as people who are also oppressed by the intersections of race and class, even if they are not indigenous or black, nor very aware, and simultaneously as people who might sometimes benefit and uh, also reproduce these intersections. So it is also worth naming racism as a structural um, issue. Our argument in favor of the alternative grammars of racism doesn't then preclude the worthiness of, of this naming um, of racism. Talk in terms of racism and racial disadvantage as structural issues, not just individual acts of stigmatization or, discrimina or discrimination, can help wider claims for social justice and for change. So, I mean, we want to just conclude saying that this current turn to anti-racism um, that is seeking um, and seeking this precision of naming racism as structural can be useful to highlight less visible racialized 
and intersectional dimensions of inequality and of the variety of struggles that people are organizing around in the, in the continent and elsewhere. We don't think that this is exclusive of Latin America. We think that this can highlight systemic intersections of racial, gendered, and class inequality and disadvantage. And of course, can help us push forward this radical horizon and a radical agenda of social transformation. So thank you very much. We finish with that. Thank you very much, uh, Monica and Peter. That was fascinating. Um, and uh, we are now um, open for questions. So if you have a question, you can raise, uh, how are we doing this, Kate? Should people just put it, raise a hand in the chat? They should put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so please, uh, 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 you know, uh, think about um, questions. I have a lot of questions, so I'm just going to go ahead and take the, the chair's uh, uh, prerogative and, and pose a couple questions that um, I think might help get us started. So one question, so one thing that's not so much a question, but that I think just further information about the project that would help us think about the examples that you shared is whether you could say more about whether in each of the countries you focused on one organization or multiple organizations, because I'm just thinking about, right, like had you focused on different organizations, would you have found different things? Or if you were looking at multiple organizations but are just highlighting certain ones in your presentation. So I think just some, a little bit more on the, the methodology of the project would be helpful for, um, I think, people to, um, to know, um, you know, so for example, if child racismo was your case in Colombia, like how did you choose that? How did that happen? That would be, I think, helpful. Um, for folks to know. And then I had a, um, a question about the alternative grammars of racism. Um, I'd love to hear more about why, um, you know, why the term grammars. Um, and then I think, you know, I think there's something, I think there's something really interesting about the concept, because I think it, I absolutely agree with, with, with your claim that there are ways in which a lot of organizations are talking about these structural and racialized forms of subordination, but resist the language of um, racism directly or avoid it for different reasons. So, so one question I had was that I felt like there was tension in some ways um, between the sort of focus on class in some parts of what you were saying. And then in, other, in some of the cases, it seems like it wasn't the race and class, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, connection that mattered so much, but things like safety, land, violence, right? All of these sort of structural struggles that so that aren't necessarily, I mean, that are about structural inequality. But if you think about right the 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 women in Brazil, the mothers fighting against police violence, um, right? So, what? So, is it all? Is the question of, of why focus on class in the framing of this language of alternative grammars of anti-racism when it seems like the potential locations in terms of structural inequality or connections are multiple? I guess is is. Um, is one question um, that I had. So maybe I'll, I'll let you guys um, think about those and hopefully we'll get some questions from folks in the audience. Yeah, um, should I say something and then you please, yeah? Okay, yeah, sure. So about the methodology, I mean, in each country we had around is it, is it like five or six projects that were looking depth. So child racism is just one of the projects of Colombia that was particularly striking because of how they present themselves. And we, so almost, there are many different categorizations we've been going through with the different cases and just thinking about how to map them. And actually it's interesting because 
Now I can see in Mexico, for example, new organizations almost uh, replicating or in a similar vein as child racismo and that have a, so, so you, it is helpful to just see what kind of, we call it a more entrepreneurial anti-racism and the kinds of things that they say, but it's only one of a variety. So each country had a variety of cases that we look in depth and a variety of cases that were more contextual and that help us frame other things. But we recognize that we are missing a lot of others. One big gap, for example, is we, did, we didn't look into um, cases looking at um, sexual diversity, for example, or all the, you know, there, there, are, there are many things missing, but we did, we did what, what was possible in that frame or that what we found as well, you know, as field works go, what was coming our way in that time. So about your other question, um, I'm sure Pete has much more to say about that. What I would think is that the use of class in this context helps us is an example of the possibilities of the alternative grammars of anti-racism but that particularly looking at class in the context of mestizaje sort of makes sense suddenly to breach that big claim that class is the issue or that race is the issue and actually brings that together. And I think we just wanted to observe, I think the way that we, we were first focusing on, are they naming or not racism? And then we shifted away from that. And now we're looking, how is this intersection working? But this, of course, it's a very promising concept that gives us space to look at many other things, which I think we do bring, but I mean, it's a fair comment that we could emphasize even further, the multiplicity of things. But I think this is an opening that allows us to see all those connections because the Rede and, and has a big gender component that we can also, in another chapter of the book, we basically look at, at the, what we also call the intersectional turn alongside the anti-racist turn and how that case particularly shows a very interesting way in which motherhood is presented. So we can also go through that way. So I think at, for the purposes of this presentation, it was looking at that, but indeed, the concept is rich and productive, and we're hoping to see it being used, and we will see it as well further. We will use it further and keep, you know, opening up these possibilities. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I'd agree with that. I, I think I'd add that, uh, <clears throat> you know, maybe where we're using, or I'm, I would, would be, I'm using the term class in a very broad way. So to indicate a variety of structural inequalities. And, you know, I mean, I suppose, you know, I, I think I was um, influenced strongly by, by Stuart Hall, who, you know, said that um, race was the way in which class was lived, I think. No, wait, class was lived through race. That's the way he, he put it, didn't he, in relation to, you know, that comment has often been taken to apply to, 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 to Britain. Uh, where issues that are clearly re related to the kind of class structure of the whole society are experienced and lived through and talked about in terms of, of race, of immigration, you know, the, 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 that uh, our position as working class white people is bad because of all these immigrants coming from Africa and the, the Caribbean and so on. So kind of displacing ideas about inequality and so on onto race. So for me, you know, what, what's happening in Latin America is kind of the other way around, is that issues of race are talked about through class. And in that sense, you know, class is kind of a stand-in for a whole series of structural inequalities of land, of, you know, if you think, well, what, you know, if you're struggling about land, ultimately what's underlying that is the fact that you're, you don't have, you know, you're poor, you know, it's part of the class structure is your is land tenure very basic part of the, of the class structure or if you're suffering from police violence and so on you know the, why are you suffering from police violence? well you live in a favela is the main reason that you know the the mothers always mention um why you're li living in a favela because you don't have any money so all these things are, are linked to the class structure so yeah maybe it's 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 wrong to just use these terms race and class nowadays, especially you know when there's a more intersectional and, and multiple analysis and so on. But that's kind of why um, 
why I use that, that terminology. And in terms of why we use the, the word grammar, um, you know, we could have talked about discourse. It would have been easy to talk about discourse, but we were interested because we're talking about language very specifically and the use of the word, or partly that's what we we're interested in is whether people use that word racism, you know, which can, isn't necessarily, um, you know, the be on an end or, um, so the, you know, the idea of grammar sort of, and the way in which you can say something that makes sense, so, you know, syntactically, it works as a sentence. You know, if you work, if you use the word racism, there's some people will sometimes go, oh no, that, you know, that isn't appropriate. In, you know, in, in Latin America, we don't need to talk about that stuff. So it's almost as if you're sort of saying something that isn't syntactically or grammatically correct if you're using the word racism. So, so that's partly why we, we focused on this word grammar. But really, you know, we are talking about um, classificatory schemas and, and discourses and so on. That's what's behind the word, the word grammar. Great, thank you both. Um, so we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. So I'm gonna go ahead and read the first one from Kristen Collins. And sorry if I'm butchering the pronunciation of your name. And she says, thanks so much for sharing this fascinating work. I'm curious about the ways that experiences of recent and explicitly racialized violence impact the perception of racism. For example, I'm thinking about how recent organizing around genocide has led to public conversation about race and racism in Guatemala. Did you observe differences related to temporal proximity to explicitly racialized violence? Very good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you wanna go, Pete? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, the answer is yes, we did. Um, one example that was looked at by Maria Moreno, who was the, the person who did the Wimby example, she also looked at um, the Saraguro 29, which was a, a, a 29 people from the Saraguro indigenous nationality uh, in Ecuador, who during a street protest were arrested by the police by a huge kind of military police operation um, and were arrested and then some quite a few of them, I'm sorry, I can't remember how many, were sentenced to jail and, so on, and they became a, a cause celebre and were known as the Los 29 de Saraguro. And there was a huge uh, battle, legal battle around them and so on. So, I mean, one of the things that came out of that case study was the fact that they had been attacked, physically attacked, mm. beaten up, dragged out of their houses, men, women, children, um, specifically targeted because they looked indigenous so that people, you know, who were indigenous people who just happened to be walking past, you know, suddenly were dragged into the into a police van and so on uh, and, and beaten. Um, and, you know, it's, it was quite clear that what they were doing, they were grabbing uh, indigenous men by the hair and pulling them, which is a kind of very sim symbolically charged thing to do, not just in Ecuador, but through the Andes, where the, that ponytail you know, is, is, a, is, a, is a, a big sign of indigenous identity and is, is often been cut off in, 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 in uh, racist violence and so on, uh, and has to be cut off before you go into, or used to have to be cut off before you went into the army and so on, and at school, etc. You know, that it became very clear that that violence was targeted specifically at indigenous bodies. And the, re the impact of that was that they talked about racism, they talked about it as racism and used that kind of framing to think about that, um, that experience. So that's one example, and there are, there are others, uh, but that's one you know, very clear example. So yeah, it's very clear that, especially with indigenous people, the impact of violence leads to racism. And you, you know, if you look at Brazil and what's happened there, and the extremely clear racialized violence against indigenous people, some of the indigenous people in Brazil are very uh, willing to talk, use the language of racism and the concept of racism to frame what they do. Yeah, maybe we can add to that the case of Colombia of the civic strike of Buenaventura, which was also another case where there was a decision of the organizing Black people to not talk about racism per, per se, but talk about the working conditions and the situation of the port. But then with the violence, that sort of reverted. And again, racism became an appropriate way of of the dressing. So this, um, yeah, violence is a, a key element that brings about, in most cases, a very explicit talk about racism. 
Hmm. Very interesting. Um, we have another question from Andre Dorce. Um, and he says, Hi, Monica and Peter. Thanks so much for sharing this rich and fascinating research. How would you characterize the role of national, the role national configurations play in structuring singular mestizo formations, which in turn frame the potentialities of race as a category for social conversation? Take, for instance, the case of Mexico or Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, Can you just read the first bit again? So I didn't. Um... Sure. So, mm. how would you characterize the role of national configurations in structuring singular mestizo formations, which in turn frame the pot potential use of race as a category? Okay. Yeah. Should I start, Monica? Or? Please do. I'm trying to work out what, yeah. what it means. Yeah. No. Um, I mean, the role of the national. I mean, obviously, these are countries that have very well. It's not very different. I mean, <clears throat> and they have diverse experiences of racial formation and of ways of thinking about mestizaje and so on. So you know, Brazil and Mexico, um, both of, of them, the idea of, of mestizaje or mestizaje is very central to their uh, national formation has been you know, explicitly deployed uh, by the state, by the government through you know, the 20th century and so on as being a key thing. Um, in Colombia and Ecuador, <clears throat> it's also there, but not quite in the same institutionalized way. <clears throat> um, and you know, it's very clear that in Brazil, um, because of the character of the racial formation there and the focus on blackness particularly, which has had you know, a long trajectory and the celebration and the making space for a certain image of blackness you know, with Gilberto Freire's work and so on, um, a, a kind of exoticized, uh, romanticized view of blackness and of indigenousness for that matter. Um, that that is very distinct from Mexico, where blackness has not really been a part of that kind of national formation uh, in hardly at all, and not in, in especially in relation to indigenousness. So you know it's very obvious that there that in Brazil, Brazil is always the kind of a bit of the exception in terms of to whether race is a is a and, and blackness are explicitly talked about because you know there's a long long history in Brazil from the 1910s 20s. Uh, with the black press in Sao Paulo and so on, and then with Abadias no Nascimento and the black theater, etc. Um, you know, there's been a long history there of talking quite explicitly about uh, racism or at least about prejudice um, in the early days, racial prejudice, um, and of mobilization around blackness, and then an early recognition, 1995, you know, state presidential acknowledgement at least that racism was maybe I don't use the exact word but anyway you know there was a kind of formal statement by Cardozo that uh, you know racial inequality was was an issue for Brazil and so on so you know that's very different from somewhere like Mexico where all of that uh, has has only just sort of started really the recognition of, of blackness where we talk about racism of, of any kind has only just started in the last let's say 10 years um, and then Colombia and Ecuador kind of sit somewhere in the middle. So yeah, I don't know if that quite answers your question, but yet it does make a difference for sure. But sorry, I should just add as a, as a rider to that, we didn't, we wanted to try and avoid the kind of methodological nationalism of focusing, you know, making a kind of strictly comparative analysis between these diff four different nations as if they were four isolated units. You know, we were, we were more interested in a, in a relational uh, analysis that tried to look at processes of exchange and movement between these uh, these national formations uh, as well and the exchange of ideas so in lots of places things look very similar a black women's you know group that focused on hair for example in ecuador in colombia in brazil look very similar in terms of their of what they were trying to do in their agenda and so on i could add to that and and that for the mexican case for example the, the way in which mestizaje ideology has developed has meant that there is a strong connection between um, 
and a, a public understanding of racism as discrimination and a strong use of discrimination as a term. And that has a lot of problems, a lot of uh, limitations to the understanding. So in a way, racism, when understood as discrimination, loses the potentiality of its structural references. Even if you talk about, um, well, some defenders of the term because it's the legal term, um, that is recognized, uh, not racism, but discrimination. Did they say, well, it is, it, is, it does address structural issues, but I think it has, it could, but it also could not very much so. So then it becomes like a place of leakage, you know, a, a place where the strength of having a discussion on oppression becomes a discussion of stigmatization of, vict of individual situations, um, um, of attitude, etc. I don't know if that adds to that. So then we will see in each context, how are the terms understood and used and what are the effects of those uses? And I think in the case of Mexico, discrimination is the most, the biggest disadvantage in terms of language for advancing a more progressive agenda. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so um, for folks who ask questions, if you have follow up questions, please go ahead and 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 place those in the Q and A. Um, so maybe while we see if, if any other questions um, come from the audience, something that you all said about and and raised by this this last question about you know um, part of the makes me think that maybe um, it would be helpful for folks, if you talked a little bit more, said some more about the challenge of doing this kind of comparative project, right? You know, mm. of bridging all of these very different national contexts and trying to think about them in this relational rather than, you know, um, separate and distinct way that Peter was talking about. The other element of comparison that I was wondering about is whether you found any difference between the um, the cases of indigenous and Afro descendant organizations in terms of their willingness to um, or their the way in which they engage more directly with the with the language of racism or the alternative grammars or is that um, equal equally um, you know um, uh, distributed across those those kinds of uh, movements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think as we kind of show that it, it, it goes in this continuum, isn't it? Like a, a continuum for more clarity, less clarity. And what we found is that each of them, particularly when you bring an intersectional perspective, each mobilization or group requires that you do an empirical assessment, right? That you cannot bluntly just say, this is, this is the way in which um, the uses of language are mainstream. But what we found was this continuum of either have been more or less in focus. And I think we use that phrase of being more or less in focus as signaling these complicated strategies and also pointing, well, that maybe they're not strategies. For some, it's just, you know, how things are, maybe how they decided at some point or not. And I guess what we end up claiming is that maybe doing a strategy about it, being more explicit about it, how is it that each organization wants to engage because of their empirical specific context could be a way to strengthen their struggle or to strengthen their, their anti-racist, well, oh, well, not only anti-oppression, anti anti-racist, uh, their struggle for, you know, like Zapatistas, uh, the CNI, the Congreso, and the Consejo, they talk about their struggle for, for life, you know, and they talk about life, and in that they bring all these different elements to it. So I think, yeah, I don't know if this is just, but I think it would be good to just see, I would take it like that, you know, we need to address it contextually, empirically looking at to what extent and what comes in and out of focus and why let's make it explicit hmm. yeah i mean the challenges of doing this kind of comparative work is it's interesting um because i mean there's a couple of things come to mind one is that the researchers the postdocs we had working in each country 
in each case were from that country, except for Colombia, where the postdoc was came from Venezuela, which is you know fairly sort of similar. But she was the only one who was going into a kind of you know a situation where she wasn't at home, sort of thing in inverted commas. So you know, in each case, and that then contrasted with the fact that you know there was I always felt there was something kind of very generic, or there was always a sense that anti-racist organisations you know, looked very similar in many ways, um, especially once you put racism front and center, and what they were doing looked, so, you know, a black women's hair group in, in Bogota or in Medellin and in Rio looks extremely similar to one in London, for example. You know, they're doing the same thing, they're using the same discourse, they're using the same idea about, you know, going natural shape, taking all your hair off and that being a kind of rebirth and awakening and coming to consciousness of, uh, of being a woman, of being a black woman, of being an African woman, et cetera, et cetera. All that was looked sort of very generic. So somehow there was a kind of tension between that slightly generic quality and then the kind of the embeddedness of the postdocs uh, researchers in their kind of home territory where there was a tendency for them to kind of take for granted some of the categories or the ideas about indigeneity and blackness and so on that were particular to their, their country. Um, and somehow, I guess, you know, people like Monica and me who were, and other co-investigators you know, co who were sitting on a, a level sort of above the, the field work of the postdocs who were in, you know, at the, at the coal face, the nitty gritty of working with these organizations face to face. You know, we had to sort of try and mediate in some way between these quite sort of taken for granted national framings of, of indigenous and black difference and of mestizaje and of the nation and so on and the, the more globalized generic quality of of anti-racist uh, actions so yeah i don't know if that that's not really an answer to your question it's just you know a couple of things that, that come to my to come to mind um and yeah we did find a difference between indigenous and and afro organizations not a radical difference some indigenous organizations talked about racism in quite a clear way um, especially in, in 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 Brazil, as I said, um, where they were suffering, they felt they were really suffering, you know, extermination, really. Um, uh, and some Afro organisations, on the other hand, you know, didn't talk about racism very openly. Um, I think in both cases, what was interesting was that the difference between the public and 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 the, and the public statements that were made by the organisations in the press, talking, you know, on the streets and so on where they the tendency was not to talk about racism and then what they did in an interview when you ask them say listen what do you think about this you know is racist what do you think about it and then it all came out so that's quite an important difference as well you know in the wimby thing it was very obvious you couldn't find almost nothing about racism uh, in public statements made by them made by the church on their behalf made by ngos and so on in the press and yet when you sat them down in interview and said what do you think about racism wow you know porque somos negros that's why <laughs> it was very interesting yeah, i'd like Cassie to has a question yeah thanks i'd like to um jump in here um just the last comment peter mm. raises a question of whether people deliberately don't use the word racism because they think that it might not resonate with the national climate. So it's a strategy more than how they see their struggle. And the, the, I'm not going on, I'm not sure how to frame this as a question, but we have focused a lot, um, a lot of conversations about race in the US and how it operates and, and so on. So hearing your discussion on Latin America, different countries and, and the, the complexities. It just brings the Caribbean to mind and which represents a different kind of reality where for the most part you have governments and ruling classes that are predominantly black, not always, um, and the, grid, the shading of black might be different, but it's less how do you talk about race in a situation like that and how it intersects with class when, um, for example, poor black Jamaicans would still talk about um, 
in certain situations, it would say it's because we're black, you know, people still talk about race, even when structurally, you know, it's not always easy to say that people are discriminating, the, the system is discriminating against them structurally. And so how, to what extent does self-perception matter in how you determine how people experience um, oppression, whether it's class or race? Um, especially in, in, in societies where, as you say, issues of hair is still very much um, prevalent, where um, in Jamaica, you know, you have schools saying that children with Rastafarian hairstyles, well, Rastafarian children have to cut their hair. And, you know, the, there's a lot of clear anti-Black sentiments. Mm. Mm. Monica, you know, we should slide. <laughs> you start if you want, I don't mind. Um, well, what I think is that self-perception is, is, I mean, it is very important to one extent to be able, or to a large extent, but it, to be able to organize and engage in anti-racist, explicit anti-racist work. But it also, um, requires, it's almost like, yeah, we need to have some sort of self-identification that allow us to join the organizing or the clarity, but at the same time, we need to understand why certain groups of people have chosen um, or have been in situations where they cannot engage or they have, they, they struggle with engaging with that and try to deny a system that is oppressive. In some cases, it's been like national formations as we were talking that, have kind of developed in that way that want to avoid race talk, that want to move people into more like a citizen language or another kind of, of language. But at the same time, we see that there are big sediments and of course, not only sediments, but like, well, racism is kind of structuring the ways that these society. So we, we, how would you explain not talking about race when wanting a child to cut their hair because of there. So, so it doesn't kind of make sense. But I also am very sympathetic of understanding, of trying to understand why people will find it difficult to self-identify as Black or as Indigenous. And I think there's, they are, those are always like big questions. We usually tend to research um, the resistance, you know, the people that organize, the groups that are very self that they are very aware that they are very clear and that because they are more available and because they are more hopeful as researchers, we want to go for the hope maybe, and we want to look for that. So I'm very interested when we think about what about those people that can't, they won't, they've, they've done a lot to kind of conserve a, a certain sense of dignity within their, their understanding of what it is by not engaging with those ideas. And I think more than giving you an answer, I just pose that that is a question that requires more understanding. But I'm very sympathetic of that struggle, I would say. Yeah, I guess I, I'd, I'd add that, um, I mean, the Caribbean is, is an interesting case and we didn't obviously uh, you know, work there. I've never worked in the Caribbean myself, but done that research there, but I've, I've read obviously a fair amount about it. Um, you know, I think it, that's a good example of where uh, the discourse of race is a dis where, or where blackness, and you can understand that blackness isn't just about phenotype, it's about a kind of moral quality or uh, a certain kind of behaviors and so on, which are associated strongly with class. So, um, you know, phenotype isn't irrelevant because, as you said, you know, the higher echelons of Caribbean society, Jamaican society, do tend to be much lighter skinned than the lower echelons. And, you know, structurally that difference between, uh, you know, black and, and mulatto in inverted commas, you know, has been important in Haiti, for example, it's structured the whole process of, of revolution and so on there. Um, you know, so that is quite a, an important, that, that colorism, that color spectrum is, is, is important. But it's also, it's also interesting how blackness gets associated with certain kinds of other dimensions, behavior, uptown, downtown, or et cetera, um, certain types of music, certain types of sexual behavior, et cetera, certain kinds of gender relationships and so on, all get associated with 
with with blackness. So you can still have that those kinds of hierarchies without there being a clear sort of white black uh, racial dimension to that um, to that hierarchy. Um, and yeah, I think you're right that people do are nervous about using the the word racism in a kind of public forum because they they feel like you know it'll it won't be accepted or you know they'll be um, uh, excluded or sort of marginalized if they use that language and that's part that's part of it but it's also um you know people do use the word racism and race i mean in, in ecuador in colombia and so on it is much more out there it is you know much more part an option these days to talk use that language so it was interesting that in in ecuador for example these local leaders you know didn't talk about it even in a public forum even in for example uh, a document that was written by them, by local leaders, with help from academics and, and church leaders, and that was directed to the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, you know, that UN committee. They wrote a document for that, and they hardly mentioned the word racism. They mentioned discrimination, you know, only a few times. So that was, like, really strange, because it was a, a formal document. They were all talking about land and, and, and injustice and violence and so on, but they didn't talk about about racism. Very interesting. Uh, we have um, more of a comment than a question from Luis Valdivieso. Thank you very much, Monica and Peter, for this critical study that allows us to sharpen the analysis of racism in the Latin American and Caribbean regions for those interested in the subject. And I guess that um, raises um, um, uh, something that, you know, if we don't, I'm doing last call for um, questions in the Q&A. So if you have any questions, please put them in now. But something that I wanted to ask you to reflect on, um, which is, um, you know, like, what are, what are some, some things that now that you're done with the volume, you're about to start presenting the book, what are some of your main takeaways, things that, you know, and, you know, things that stand out to you from the volume, perhaps in addition to what you've already said, but also maybe in terms particularly of where does this kind of research, you know, this kind of comparative um, research on racism and anti-racism in Latin America, what do you think are some, you know, are some future lines of inquiry or things that you think um, would help push the field forward? Yeah, well, I could, I could say that, well, there are many takeaways, but one that um, I'm very pleased with is the analysis we've done around intersectionality and, and how this turn to anti-racism that we uh, sort of analyze um, is also breeding an intersectional subject, or they are correlating an intersectional subject with an intersect with an in, with this anti-racist turn, and and this is kind of bringing very interesting um, possibilities of of action, um, and also another way of an, an analyzing what's happening for different subjects. Um, so I like that. I also think that is very interesting, the very inclusive nature of our approach, where we were really wondering how can we avoid the question uh, or the, the value, the, um, the judgment of are these organizations worth enough? You know, what is good enough? And noticing how much judgment there is constantly within any kind of struggle. Not you can see that within feminist groups, anti-racist groups, and others of like you're wrong. That's not the right way. That's not radical enough. That's not good enough. That's not like you know where we are sort of um, having a very impossible measuring or very high bar. And what we try here to do was like if we are going to suspend that. If we suspend that judging, how can we bring everyone and recognize that any anti-racist work does something to the context and to the world, even if it's not what we think it should be, or like that idea of like complete 
change of state of affairs. So I think that that's very productive. First of bringing people in and together, of avoiding this division, because then it becomes an internal fight or an internal like, yeah, like who is doing the best anti-racist work or something. And what we're saying here is like, they are all contributing in different ways. How can they all sharpen? What are What is the this radical horizon that these organizations are having? What can they do if they manifest it, if they make it explicit? Oh, you know, so I think that's also, I mean, there are more things to say, but I would I would think that that's something I, I'm taking and some of the things that come to mind right now. And in terms of where is it going? I think it's very interesting to see how 20 years ago or so we were like proving the point that racism exists. And we were all like, okay, let me show you, let me demonstrate. I mean, your work, my work, we were all like sort of trying to bring in different ways. Look, this is how racism is deployed. And then there's been all the shift to understand what, uh, what are we doing now? And I think this is gonna still take a while because there's so much more we're not understanding of actions and practices and discourses of anti-racism of like, what are the logics? And I think that's what is happening right now. And there will be more, I mean, the two projects that Pete is doing, there are, there are other things. But in my view, what we need now is of course, is not of course, but is after this assessment of what's, of that it exists and none of what we do against it is uh, what are we imagining? What it is, what's in that radical vision? How can we move to that radical, you know, following the tradition of the black radical imagination, but that was the indigenous radical imagination. How do we move from the complaint and the denouncing um, to the imagination, to the proposed proposal? And also how do we distinguish, and this comes from one of my brilliant PhD students that is really making me very pleased with these dialogues we have from survival work, which a lot of anti-racist work commits to, to revolutionary work. So I think that's kind of where I see this, this leap, you know, to, to work that is um, imagining in other ways. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I mean, I found it really, really hard to, to to see how to achieve a kind of balance between wanting to be inclusive in the way that Monica has, has talked about um, and not sort of judging people in, a, in a, an anti-racist Olympics, who's going to get the gold medal, who's going to get the, uh, the bronze medal, etc. And yet still, so to be inclusive, you know, take into account the people who never get to the Olympics in the first place and, you know, they're struggling away at grassroots level. Um, trying to get a football team together or something um and yet still sort of have that that radical horizon that doesn't just say oh well anything anything goes you know any any action is as good as any other action which you know is is, is clearly not true either um and there's some might be some actions that people are taking you know especially when it comes from the state they say yeah we're taking anti-racist action and this is what we're doing you know where you want to say well no that's that really isn't good enough that's actually causing more problems than and it's solving um so it's you know it is quite hard to get a kind of balance between that inclusivity on the one hand and that kind of a, a radical horizon on the other hand where your radical horizon somehow operates in a way to orient struggles in in a in a, in a general way without it becoming an olympics of of anti-racism yeah, so that's a kind of problem for the for the that I don't think we haven't entirely I haven't don't feel like I've entirely resolved. So that's a kind of problem for the future. Um, and for me, another another issue for the future is to try and uh, grapple with the effective dimensions of of racism and anti racism, rather than treating it as a kind of issue of policy or of logical, you know, proving to somebody race doesn't exist, therefore racism is wrong. So on, you know, is to kind of grapple with the idea that racism really is is a, a visceral thing. Uh, and doesn't depend on sort of a logic and a bureaucratic logic and, and so on. So it's not much good trying to attack it with, you know, bureaucracy and, and policy, rationally thought out policies, if people aren't thinking about the, these things in a rational way. So, yeah, the role and things some, that you're interested in, Juliet, as well, is uh, 
is what role does art have to play in or artistic action have to play in um, in combating racism you know because art arguably you know gets it at that effective dimension in a particular kind of way Yeah, and that's I a think... very long standing debate, right, among people. Yeah. If you think about Black thinkers thinking about these questions, too, how do you reach people um, and, and make ch anti racist change? Yeah. Sorry, Patsy, were you going to say something? No, I was just going to thank you all for this really fascinating discussion that, you know, has taken a conversation um, about how people think about their reality forward. And um, I just want to thank Monica and Peter for sharing this really interesting research with us. I want to thank Juliet for um, guiding us through the discussion um, and, you know, for doing this so ably. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you to Kate and our communication team at Watson. Um, I also want to just announce that the next talk in our series, Archives of Silence, which I should have mentioned, is supported by the Herbert H. Goldberger Lectureship Fund, which is administered by the Dina faculty. And the next talk would be on April 12th at 4 p.m. Um, by Gustavo Guerrero. And it's the, the title is Books, Markets, and Agents materialities of Latin American literature in the early 21st century. So please join us. It's a hybrid um, event. It will be online as well as um, physically in the Joukowsky Forum at Watson. But again, thank you all so very much for this really yeah. interesting talk. Well, thanks for the invitation and thanks to everyone for attending and thanks, Juliet. Thank it was you. my thanks. pleasure. Thanks, I'm very Patsy. much looking forward to reading the book. Thank you. Yay! Yes. And thanks to our audience. Yeah, thank you everyone. Yes. Okay. See you. Thank you.